Today across the world, there are over 1 billion people who claim to be Christians. This sentence is remarkable when we think about the fact that one, it's worldwide, and two, that that number is over 1 billion people. Just 1,986 years ago, around 50 people were in an upstairs room of a house praying together and waiting for a gift Jesus had promised. In our last episode, Jesus Christ Starts the Church, we talked about Jesus and who he was and when he died, rose again, and then ascended into heaven, and how he told his followers to go to Jerusalem and wait for a gift. And they've been waiting there for about 40 days. Outside, the streets are full of people. Jews from all around have come. It is Shavuot, also called Pentecost. You are there, unaware of the small band of people praying in an upper room of one of many houses. You're there to celebrate. Tucked into your clothes and wrapped neatly are two loaves of bread. They are the first two loaves made from the wheat you harvested, and you are bringing them to the temple. Last night, you read through the Shavuot with your family, and then read the book of Ruth. Not everyone still reads during this celebration, but you want your family to grow to love God. Even in this time of Rome and uncertainty with the temple, you have wondered about Jesus and if he really was the Messiah. But since his death, you've tried to move on with your life. Leave those thoughts behind. Raise your children to love the law. But this year, celebrating is different. You don't feel happy. You're discouraged, lost. More than Jesus died that Passover weekend, hope died. People have stories about him being alive again, raising from the dead. Maybe it's true, although you're afraid to believe it. No one will follow all the customs. No, you will follow all the customs of your ancestors. You will bring your bread to the temple. You will celebrate. In the upper room of the house you walked by, something is happening. The group is praying. They've been praying for over 40 days, taking shifts to eat and sleep, but praying and waiting. At this moment, they are praying, and suddenly, around them, things begin to move. A mighty wind is blowing around them and inside the home. And then fire. The fire swirls around and then stops on top of each person, men and women in the room. There's silence. And then... Everyone is speaking, but in so many different languages, praising God and praising Jesus Christ. Peter is there, and suddenly, with courage, he begins to speak. We must do what we are called to do. We are called to preach. He leaves the room, hurries down the stairs, and out into the streets. You just passed the house when you heard the commotion. Why? Why was this large crowd suddenly leaving the house altogether and running into the streets and shouting? You climb up the steps of a nearby house so you can see. The crowd seems to be celebrating, laughing, and speaking all at the same time. Clearly, this is a group that has come to celebrate the Passover and has just had too much to drink. Although they are clearly having fun and something deep inside you wishes you could smile again. Other people have come out of their homes to see what's going on, and a man yells from his window, a bunch of drunks. But you start to notice something else. You are understanding every single word they are saying, but it seems everyone in the crowd is understanding every single word. There's a large group of Ethiopians, and over across the road, Arabs, and in the middle of the street, Cretans, and and you're a Hebrew, and Everyone is communicating with these people. How is that possible? One of the men steps forward and begins to speak. The whole crowd has gathered and is suddenly quiet. Every single person seems to be understanding what he is saying. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I have to say. These people are not drunk, well, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Remember, he said, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. 
I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to do miracles, wonders and signs, which God did among you through him as you yourself know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death. Because it was impossible for death to keep a hold on him. David even said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand and I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb, his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and he knew that God had promised him an oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that the Messiah was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did the Messiah's body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we, we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit on my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. You feel as if someone has taken a knife and and cut your heart in half. Suddenly you're crying, you're, you're sobbing, and so is every single person around you. You hear the man in the window who had called out yelling the, about drunks, and he calls out again. This time he says, brothers, what shall we do? Peter yells back, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord your God will kill. With many other words, Peter continued to speak and plead with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. That was the first church service, and that day, on the celebration of first fruits, the Pentecost, over 3,000 men and women were saved and baptized, and the church was born. For the early church, it was like a revival every single day. They met together every day to listen to the apostles preach, and they all lived together. They shared everything, and their life was only about learning more about who Jesus was and and what God wanted them to know. On Saturdays, they still went to the temple, as all the Jewish people did, but the leaders of the temple were not happy with the church. There was no new religion. The word Christian had not been invented yet. It was Jewish people who loved and served God, now worshiping Jesus Christ, who is God. One day, Peter and John were walking to the temple, and they saw a man begging for food or money or anything. He could not walk, so his family took him every day to the temple to beg. Peter and John walked over to the man, and Peter said, I don't have gold or silver for you, but what I do have I'll give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. He took his right hand and lifted the man, and instantly his ankles and his feet were strong, and he could walk. The man began to jump and then run and ran into the temple praising God. The man began to show that he'd been healed by Jesus Christ. Everyone in the temple emptied into the courtyard to see what had happened. And then Peter stood before them. Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if you're our own power or godliness? We made this man walk. 
The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and the Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God, God raised him from the dead and we are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man who you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus name and the faith that came through him that has completely healed him as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins can be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets have spoken, have foretold of these days and you You are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. About 5,000 men and women followed Jesus Christ. The leaders of the temple were very angry. They grabbed Peter and John and threw them into prison. The sun was starting to rise. The night before, the church had grown by thousands when they heard the words of Peter. This morning, the streets are quiet, but a group of Jewish leaders are meeting. Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and members of Ananias' family, they're angry and confused and nervous. They thought they had ended all this when Jesus was killed, but Then his tomb had turned up empty and the body hadn't been found. And now his disciples, who they always thought to be kind of fools, they started this movement in just a few days that might even be larger than when they had before Jesus died. So Peter and John were brought before them and it spoke to them. By what power did you make that man heal him? Then Peter, who was filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, If we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, okay, well then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given by mankind by which we must be saved. Now the group is even more confused. Peter speaks as if he's a trained orator, not a fisherman. What can they do? They can't throw him in prison for healing a man. All they can do is tell him to stop talking with Jesus and let him go free. So then they called them in again and they commanded them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes to listen to you or to God? You be the judge. As for us, we can't help speaking about what we've seen and heard. Although they threatened them some more and then they let them go. They couldn't decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man was miraculously healed after 40 years. So the church continued to grow. Peter and John continued to preach and do miracles, always in the name of Jesus Christ. The temple leaders began to grow even more angry and jealous. They threw them in prison, but God sent angels to let them out. They immediately went back to the temple and kept preaching, and then more joined the church. And as the church grew, Satan attacked both from outside and inside. 
Now, the church was made entirely of Jewish people. But if you remember from our last episode, there were two kinds of Jewish people. Those who were Greek and tended to live outside of Jerusalem and read from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Torah, and the Jews who spoke Hebrew and lived according to Jewish traditions and read from the Hebrew Torah. The two groups began to fight, and the disciples, who really wanted to be out preaching, were instead listening to quarrels and putting out fights and taking care of sick and widows. And so the church picked seven men to serve. One of the men they, pre- they picked was Nicholas, who was a man who was not born Jewish, but had converted to Judaism and now was a Christian, although the name Christian hadn't been invented yet. So these men began leading and caring for the church while the disciples continued to preach. And every single day, the church grew. One of the other men that they picked was named Stephen. You're standing in the middle of a crowd. Stephen is arguing with some men and some men from the synagogue of the freedmen have come to debate Stephen. These men are Jews and you're shocked by how well Stephen speaks. Everything he says is so direct and clear. The men trying to argue with him kind of sound like fools. The men address the crowd. We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. Others in the crowd begin to shout, and the crowd is getting angry. You feel someone push you as they storm to the front of the crowd, and you see it is someone from the temple. As he moves through the crowd, others begin joining him, and you watch as they grab Stephen and begin to pull him toward the temple. You follow. You've seen this before with Peter and John. The temple leaders will probably put Stephen in jail for the night like they've done with others. But this time the crowd seems angry. Other times the crowd has been on the side of Peter and John, but this is different. The crowd has been turned against Stephen. Stephen is pulled toward the Jewish leaders who demand to hear what he has to say. You listen as Stephen begins with creation, works his way through the life of Moses and Abraham, and in just a few minutes, he's outlined the entire Torah and then pointed everything to Jesus Christ. He's perhaps the most elegant speaker you have ever heard. But then he looks at the Jewish leaders and says that they killed the Messiah. Jesus is God and you have killed him, but he rose again and is now seated at the right hand of God. You can't help but see that Stephen's face is glowing. Something has changed and it's mesmerizing. The leaders jump and you can see them ripping their clothes and you're afraid they might do something worse than put Stephen in prison. They might even whip him or beat him, but it's worse than you thought. They pull him into the courtyard, tie his hands behind his back, force him to kneel and then circle around him. You're in shock. You've never actually seen this. You've only heard of it. Are they, are they really going to stone him to death right here in front of the whole crowd? You want to do something, but you can't stop it. You're frozen and the crowd has surrounded him and you can hear the rocks hitting Stephen. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And at this, they covered their ears, yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and stoned him. And meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. You see a man from the temple standing nearby under a tree. He's holding the coats of the Jewish leaders to keep them clean from the blood that is splattering as Stephen is beat to death. And you can't help but see how satisfied he looks. With monsters like this is the church movement over. If those who lead the church are murdered by the Jewish leaders, and if they take so much pride in it, can anyone overcome that? You try to have faith in God, but the look you see on that man's face makes it hard to have faith. The man by the tree is Saul, and he is determined to end the church movement once and for all. The death of Stephen was a turning point for the church. Stephen wasn't the only one to die. Soon church members were arrested and killed by the Jewish leadership. The Roman leaders were also not happy with the movement of the church. They already had the Jewish people to worry about and keep peaceful and happy, and now they have two groups of Jewish people fighting amongst themselves. The only thing to do is end this church movement and bring peace back to the era. So the church has the Roman government against them and the Jewish leadership against them. 
Families begin to move away from Jerusalem and spread out to different areas. Families move together and the church begins to spread. And as they move, they continue to tell the good news of Jesus Christ. Soon the church is spreading all over the Roman Empire. Around this time, the church reaches Samaria. Philip had traveled to Samaria to preach and God gave him the ability to heal people and cast out demons. And people were, of course, drawn to this. Crowds came to hear him speak and many people turned to Jesus Christ as their savior. Then one night as Philip was sleeping, an angel came to him. Philip woke up and did what the angel told him to do. He started a trip. Another man was taking the same trip, an Ethiopian, who worked for the queen of Ethiopia, but was traveling back from being in Jerusalem. The man had seen and heard so much in Jerusalem, and he was so confused. He was reading from the scroll of Isaiah. As Philip was walking, the Holy Spirit told him, hey, go and speak to that man. Philip ran catch up the chariot and saw the man was reading Isaiah. So he called out to him, do you understand what you're reading? The man answered, how can I? No one's ever explained it to me. So Philip jumped in the chariot and read the passage. He was like a sheep led to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shears is silent, he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. So the man asked, who is this person? Philip told him the good news of Jesus Christ. And the man said, clearly Jesus is the Messiah. And he wanted to be baptized and follow him. They were driving by a river. So they stopped, got out, and Philip baptized the man. And as soon as the man was baptized, the Holy Spirit took Philip away. The man then continued on to Ethiopia and spread the gospel in Ethiopia. Peter and John began traveling and preaching. And they visited Philip in Samaria where hundreds came to Christ. And they went to Lydia and Joppa. And they healed in the name of Jesus. And they even brought a woman back from the dead. The church continued to grow and spread. Now Saul. Saul is determined to end this church. And the spreading to new areas is concerning. The movement is blasphemous. Claiming a man can be God. and That he can raise from the dead. As a devout Jewish man, he will not tolerate this. Saul comes up with a plan to go to Damascus. Find the Jewish families who follow these teachings and who have fled Jerusalem, he will make an example of them. He will let people know they cannot run. Saul gets letters allowing him to arrest the families who are part of his church and bring them back to Jerusalem to face the council on the charge of blasphemy. As Saul's traveling along the way, he's suddenly hit with a bright light. His horse throws him and he is left on the road. No one else can see anything, but they are hit with an instant fear. But Saul, Saul hears the voice of Jesus Christ. Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up, go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. The light is gone, and darkness comes over Saul. Darkness Saul has never experienced. It takes just a few seconds to understand it's not just darkness. Saul is blind. The men around Saul step toward him, and they've heard the voice, but they've not seen the light. They help Saul up, and they take him to Damascus. He doesn't enter as a man ready to battle, arrest Christians. Instead, he arrives a blind man, led by his men. He's taken to a home, finds himself alone in a room. Paul drops to his knees and prays for three days. A man named Ananias arrives to see Saul. God has sent a vision to Ananias, telling him to come and find Saul and pray for his healing. Now, Ananias is a little worried. He knows who Saul is. He knows why he is here, and he prays for him and his sight to be restored. Saul and Ananias exchange stories, and Saul explains how he is now a follower of Jesus Christ, no longer an enemy of the church. He is now a part of the church. Ananias baptizes Saul, and Saul begins to preach. But his name is changed to Paul. Now, Paul knows the Old Testament better than most, and he preaches from the Torah and outlines how Jesus is the promised one. The church is nervous at first. Is this a trap? The Jewish leadership who was expecting Saul to come and help deal with the problem of the church are very angry, and the Jewish people are hungry to hear the message. Many people become part of the church, are baptized, and believe. The Jewish leaders decide they're going to have to kill Saul, who is now Paul. So he can't leave Damascus because the leaders are at the gates of the city waiting for him. So the members of the church come up with an idea. So Paul goes to the top of the wall of the city. The men put him in a large basket and then lower him over the wall. And he escapes into the night. 
his trip to Damascus did not go as planned. Instead of arriving to arrest the church, he's now part of the church. He has preached, the church has grown, and he leaves under the fear of his own life. Now Paul is traveling, preaching, and every city he preaches in, the church is planted. Paul travels to Syria and Sicily, and then he settles in Tarsus. At this time, Caligula was the emperor. He came to power when his adoptive father, Tiberius, died. Caligula started off as a good emperor, but he quickly became a tyrant. He was known for being extremely sexually promiscuous. He was cruel and a sadist. While he was in power, he built many great buildings, and he wanted the Roman Empire to stand out in architecture even more than it already did. Many of these great buildings were extra homes for himself. Caligula also added more provinces and had his eye on what would become Great Britain. At the age of 41, he was assassinated. Guards, senators, and courtiers all conspired to restore the Roman Republic with his assassination. However, the day after he was killed, his uncle Claudius became the next Roman emperor. Now, Claudius built a new ship called the Mediterranean War Gallery, and he began attacking and taking the land what is today Britain. Some say that this was when the city of London was founded. Other historians place it even earlier. Around this time, Herod Agrippa, who was ruling over the Jewish area, was having some troubles. Many people thought he was actually part of the assassination of Caligula, and history does not say if he was or if he wasn't. But Claudius, once he became the new emperor, put Agrippa in charge of Judea and Samaria, making him one of the most powerful kings. Now, the leaders in the temple, they really liked Agrippa, partly because Caligula, when he was alive, had tried to put an idol in the temple and Agrippa had stopped him. Caligula, Caligula had just put in an order for a second time that an idol would be put in the temple right before he was assassinated. And since a lot of people thought Agrippa was part of the assassination, the Jewish people liked him. Agrippa was well liked by the Jewish leaders, but he persecuted the church harshly. Agrippa had James, the son of Zebedee, arrested and killed. And he arrested Peter during a Passover celebration and planned on killing him as well. Agrippa was visiting Caesarea, where the Olympic-style games were being held in his honor. And during the celebration, people began to chant that Agrippa was God. He received this praise with joy, but then he was suddenly hit with extreme pain. He fell to the ground screaming. He was in extreme pain for five days and then died. The Bible says the angel of the Lord struck him down and he was eaten by worms. Historians say he died of a sudden and strange disease, and heart failure. His son, Herod Agrippa, was the second one to come to power. At this time, a famine came to Jerusalem. People were hungry and angry, and resentment towards the Romans was growing. The Maccabees had done the impossible by fighting for their freedom. Could it be done again? Now, the church was not part of this group. They believed Jesus would return again shortly, and the goal was to spread the message not fight for Jerusalem. This put a strain between the Jews who were following Jesus and those who were not. The Romans were also worried. The famine, the unrest of the Jewish people, the church that they couldn't squelch, instead it's just growing. Now that church is actually growing all across the Roman Empire. It's been 15 years since Jesus ascended into heaven. The church started in Jerusalem, but it's been spread into Tarsus and even Turkey, modern day Turkey. It's gone to Cyprus and Syria and Antioch, the island of Cyprus, Lystia, Derby, Galatia, Ethiopia. And meanwhile, not one book of the New Testament has been written yet. In our next episode called The Old Testament is Written, the famine in Jerusalem inspires the church to give. A council in Jerusalem decides if non-Jewish people, the Gentiles, can be part of the church. And people come up with a word to describe all those people who are part of the church. And a man named Nero comes to power. If you want to read the biblical passages from today's episode, you can find it in the book of Acts chapter 1 to 9. This is the end of episode 2, The Church is Born. For more podcasts, videos, and blogs, check out my website, lauraleesiemens.com. And be ready for our next episode coming soon, The Bible is Written. 